dear friends good afternoon the fifth and the last uh, webinar of the web series now we are going to conduct and as you are aware for the past four days we have been meeting at the same time same time uh, for eliminating webinar lecture that is webinar series conducted by uh, UG and PG Physics Department of Saint Philomena College, in association with the uh, Regional Science Center Pilikula, inspired by Dr. K. V. Rao. This web series we have been uh, conducting. Just to, to remind you, on first day, that is on 18th, uh, Dr. Haldudiri Sudindra has given a beautiful lecture on the science behind the rain. That is on 19th, Professor Kollegala Sharma has given the lecture, How to Become an Inventor. On third day, that is on 20th, Professor Keshava TN has given the webinar, Iru Dellava Bitto, the story of a vacuum. And we had a, a excellent uh, webinar on uh, by Dr. Udayananda why the sky looks with the blue color now we are coming to the last lecture of the webinar series today we will have another webinar on exciting topic that is a low dimensional materials playground of physics by dr ramesh tamankar associate professor vellur institute of technology friends Few years back, I had an opportunity to hear the lecture by Dr. Ramesh Tamankar in a conference at St. Aloysius College, Mangalore. As an invited speaker, he gave a lecture on the crystals and then physics behind the crystals and the whole issues. And it was a very excellent one. And uh, I was thinking the, to invite Professor Tamankar to the college during the uh, this particular situation, even though it is not possible, and virtually we are going to meet Professor Tamankar and to hear his uh, uh, lecture. Now I invite the coordinator of this webinar series, Dr. Deepaki De Silva, to welcome the resource person and all of you over to. Deepak. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon to everyone. First and foremost, I welcome our guest of honor and speaker, Dr. Ramesh Thamankar. He is going to speak on the topic, low dimensional materials, playground of physics. I welcome all the participants who are present for this webinar. I also welcome our HOD, Dr. A.P. Radhakrishna. Now, let me give a brief introduction of our guest. Dr. Ramesh Thamankar had completed his bachelor degree and master's degree in physics from Mangalore University. He also studied master's in technology in material science, that is MTech, in National Institute of Technology, Karnataka. He successfully completed two major projects in MTEC on the topic thin films and alloys. His interest towards research is extraordinary. He joined as a PhD scholar in the Institute of Experimental Physics, Department of Physics, Berlin, Germany, and successfully completed his PhD degree. After his PhD, he got his postdoctoral degree postdoctoral degrees respectively from University of California and Max Planck Institute, Germany. His work basically on experimental condensed matter physics, which includes research fields such as magnetism, nanotubes, thin films, quantum dots, etc. Apart from research experiences, he has profound teaching experience. Initially, he worked in the Department of Physics, SP College under Mangalore University as a lecturer. 
also he has taken classes for diploma students in the physics department of pre university berlin germany at the pres at present he is working in the department of physics school of advanced science sciences vellore institute of technology vellore as a faculty he did his research internships in the material research center indian institute of science bangalore and institute of material research and engineering singapore he has published more than 40 research articles in the international journals and wrote four chapters for different textbooks to his credit he has projects funded by different government agencies he has given invited talks in almost 30 national and international symposiums with this brief introduction once again i welcome dr ramesh thamankar welcome you sir i thank you for the uh, for the given opportunity and also uh, now i request dr apr sir to take over thank you thank you so much uh, dr ramesh over to yes. you now it is yeah. your time okay so you are able to see these slides right yeah slides yeah okay but not you thank you so much uh, professor radha krishna for inviting me and uh, uh, dr deepak also uh, it was a bit overwhelming that you did this 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 everything but i think i still i feel that i am a student of physics you know no matter how many ex years of experience uh, working experience or teaching experience you have you are still a student of this vast and beautiful subject and uh, even though in spite of uh, these uh, pandemic situation we cannot uh, meet you all physically uh, face to face but we have this beautiful tool of technology where we can meet we can speak we can discuss and uh, the science still goes on okay so uh, today's topic is uh, basically uh, molded into a form for uh, sort of undergraduate students and uh, i give i will give you a brief overview of a couple of topics which are technologically relevant and uh, by that i'm assuming that few of you are in the audience and uh, from the student community might uh, actually get inspired and uh, go for uh, higher studies in terms of research and uh, education okay and uh, i have to thank all my previous organizations who have helped me to become what i am now and uh, so currently i'm in uh, as the introduct introductory speaker said uh, i'm working for vit university now and uh, uh, i work for a newly formed center center for functional materials and we work on various technologically relevant uh, topics and if somebody wants to know more about these uh, this center uh, you are always welcome okay so uh, before we really get into the subject of low dimensional material it's always better for us to get a global view of these dimensions you know for example uh, i have plotted here a graph of uh, a size scale okay and uh, all numbers are in meters okay so in powers of 10 for example on the right side 10 to the power 26 meters corresponds to the observable universe okay so that means uh, whatever the experimental techniques we have and this is the extent of uh, observable universe we have that's, that's about 20, 10 to the power 26 meters and slightly lower in the dimensions are uh, you know these galaxies of course the universe consists of uh, uh, so many galaxies and each of them have a certain size and the extent of these uh, size is about 10 to the power 24 meters and come down a little bit uh, in the side scale for example 10 to the power 7 meters is the size of the i mean it's not absolute absolute number but uh, it's it's actually an average uh, size of uh, planet we have in the solar system okay and then you if you come to 10 to the power 0 for example so that's a human scale we are talking about that means human beings animals trucks or whatever it is where importantly newtonian mechanics is valid that's more important you have to 
uh, you have to uh, check what are the rules and what are the laws of physics are valid in various uh, dimensions. Okay, so this is the area where uh, Newtonian physics is really, really valid, and it could explain us uh, all those things which have been observed over the few centuries, like 400 years or even 500 years. Come to even smaller scale, for example, you go to the bottom and now come to the left side. This is about 10 to the power 10 meters. Okay, this side scale is the side scale of atomic atomic dimension or atomic uh, universe of at atoms for example i would say okay so you have uh, atoms of hydrogen you have atoms of uh, some other element you just check all the periodic table available for us and these atomic dimensions are in 10 to the power minus 10 meters and all these things what we do in terms of technology is in these dimensions okay from let's say one meter 10 to the power zero is one meter to 10 to the power minus 10 which is the atomic dimension where you have atoms, you have molecules, so on and so forth. Come slightly smaller in dimension 10 to the power minus 19 meters. In between, I'm skipping few of the important numbers. For example, the physical dimension of the electron is about 10 to the power 15 meters. Okay, And uh, this dimension here is the space within the nucleus. Okay, So for example, if you have... Uh, if you have a proton, for example, okay, so then the question might arise, or you can question yourself, what is inside this proton? What is inside this neutron? Okay, and the side scale is extremely small, and uh, there are quarks inside the neutron, quarks inside the proton, and uh, there is also empty space. space. Just like, Just like uh, our uh, earlier speaker, uh, day before yesterday, Professor Keshava was telling that um, uh, majority of the space is empty. Okay, so here also it is empty. Come still down in terms of the size, for example, 10 to the power minus 36. That is the scale in which uh, we can uh, think of right now. That is the scale of Planck. That's called Planck's length scale, 10 to the power minus 36 meters. So when I say dimensions, for example, you have to have this global view of what exactly I'm talking about. So right now in this uh, lecture, I'm just uh, considering myself within this side scale here. Okay, almost from the bottom to 10 to the power minus 10. Okay, all those things, whatever uh, things are happening inside this uh, side scale, do not follow the Newtonian mechanics. That's extremely important. Okay, uh, I cannot explain the. Uh, the dynamics of an electron using F is equal to ma, for example. Okay, uh, the things are quite different, and uh, these are confusing. These are beautiful. These are questionable. What not? Okay, so uh, please have an open mind and uh, open ears, of course, open mind and open eyes, and uh, let's accept the fact that the world at this level is like this. Okay, you can question why the atoms is empty why the uh, nucleus is also empty, everything. You know, these are unanswerable questions. Okay, okay. So, so, so now, now why lower dimension? dimension? Okay, so uh, our day-to-day -day experience is in three dimensions, for example. Like uh, we have played cricket for a whole of our life. It's in a three-dimensional space. We have um, uh, used a cricket wheel, a cycle wheel, for example while we were kids, I don't know what these kids use now, but uh, we were playing with these uh, wheels, you know, these are in t three dimensions and uh, the laws governing these uh, wheels are Newtonian laws. Now what happens in the low dimension materials or why do we have to learn these low dimensional materials or low dimension in, in, in general? This gives me or this gives us an opportunity to design uh, new materials and design new molecules. Okay, we have already naturally occurring molecules and atoms. So what we could do is we can uh, uh, optimize the process of manufacturing these newer and newer molecules and newer and newer materials with the exotic properties. Okay. Okay. So then, okay, fine. You design a new material. You design new molecule. So what? Okay. Then the come then the application comes into picture. So you use a new material, for example, the most talked about material since last two decades is uh, graphene, for example, okay? 
So you can synthesize this graphene and you can make this graphene available for you and you can fabricate the devices, okay? You can fabricate the devices for the sensing purpose. You can fabricate the device for a transistor uh, way. You can fabricate in terms of uh, light emitting diodes or so on and so forth. You can think of all sort of devices uh, using these newly designed and newly uh, uh, synthesized materials. Okay, fine new materials and uh, new molecules, new uh, devices, of course. And then you can think of these devices for technologically relevant applications. Like for example, uh, as I said, sensors, for example. Okay. It might be possible that your newly designed material or a newly uh, synthesized material might have better sensitivity in terms of detect detecting hazardous uh, gases uh, available in nature. For example, uh, yesterday I heard in the news that near to Shomoga there was a blast. Okay, Now you might actually think as a scientist that, oh, if at all I had a, uh, I had a newly designed device, newly fabricated device, which had a better sensitivity in terms of the individual components of the material which was blasted out, then I will know what was the reason for uh, the accident. You know, this is, these are all engineering uh, uh, aspects of uh, designing the new materials and designing the, or fabricating new devices. And ultimately for me, it gives an avenue for newer and newer science. You know, science at fundamental level. Let's say you have uh, synthesized a graphene sheet. I said uh, we get an option for uh, uh, developing newer materials and fabricating newer devices and newer performance or better performance, for example, and uh, faster response in terms of sensing. And uh, ultimately, they, it, it comes down to what new uh, science you can develop using newer materials. And that is why I put this in this form that uh, the newer materials give you technological advance, yes, but uh, at the end of the day, what you do is a newer science, okay? This is what has been done over the uh, period of period of last uh, six to seven decades. And ultimately, people wanted to understand science in better and better way, or want to understand nature better and better way. And that ended up getting better and better technological advancement. Whatever technological advancement we have now in terms of phones, in terms of memory, in terms of a transistor, for example, et cetera, et cetera, was basically a problem in a science lab. Okay, please uh, remember that. Okay, now when I say technology, for example, I, I repeat the same thing. When I say technology, most of the time we relate this to the computer industry, you know, integrated circuit. And... Uh, it started well with the design of a transistor, which is the germanium crystal here. And then these are uh, three uh, uh, connecting wires for that. This was in 1948. And come 2012, that is like all, almost uh, 60 years, from the bulk one inch uh, uh, germanium crystal, we have come to a situation where we can design a transistor of one single atom. Please soak in this information that from the time of 1948 in Bell Labs, where the first design of transistor was done using one inch or approximately that size, the germanium crystal, within the span of 60 years, we have come to a stage where we can design or rather, rather we can fabricate a transistor of one single atom. Look at the technological uh, development we had for uh, achieving this kind of uh, newer and newer uh, uh, devices, you know, updating devices. So what lies future? We don't know, actually. So here is the uh, transistor design in 2012 uh, using a single uh, phosphorus atom, in fact. And uh, a few in future, we don't know, actually, what uh, is the uh, road ahead. A lot of people are telling about quantum computer, for example, uh, neuromorphic computing, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of avenues when you are able to design and fabricate uh, devices in this small scale. Okay. If, you, if you check the, the roadmap of these uh, major companies, for example, Intel, 
what they say is around 2010, uh, sorry, 2020, they should have devices of about 10 nanometers. Uh, students, please uh, uh, think about this 10 nanometers, okay, 10 to the power, 10 to the power minus 9, 10 times 10 to the power minus 9 meters, okay. Size of an atom is, let's say, 1 nanometer or less than 1 nanometer, let's say 5 angstrom, 0.5 angstrom. So that means in your device, what you actually will have is about 20 atoms, okay. So this is the scale what we are talking about for the future technology that your entire device is of the order of 20 to 30 atoms, okay. So gone are the days when we had a big resistor in our lab and you check the codes of this one, the rings, color code, for example, and uh, you determine the resistance of that. Gone are those days and uh, you would not find them in any electronic circuitry in the phones, you know. So uh, these are the dimensions I'm, I'm going to talk about. And uh, this is another uh, uh, roadmap of uh, another company called TSMC, which is uh, a Taiwan uh, Semiconducting Manufacturing Company. And in 2019, for example, they had proposed that their devices would be about this size, five to 10 nanometers. Again, I would go back to you to check how many atoms are involved. You know, five in silicon, for example, you have interatomic distance is about 0.25 nanometer. So within one nanometer, you have four atoms. So five nanometer means about 20 atoms. You see the scale of devices we are talking about now or in future, okay? So if the number of atoms are so small, okay? So these uh, sizes are called in uh, node in uh, device language. And uh, we have been using this 22 nanometer node in our devices. If you, if you open your uh, phone now and uh, see the integrated circuit, and if at all, you will be able to see the individual component of this electronic circuitry the devices would be about 22 to 14 in that scale. But what lies is my, our future, you know, five nanometer node. And you see that the number of atoms which are very, very critical for us is about 14. This is rough number, please don't take it as in the face value, 14 or let's say 20, for example, okay. Then how many electrons you are talking about? You are talking about 10 electrons in the whole device. Okay, so obviously my uh, uh, micro level uh, circuitry or micro level uh, circuit diagrams or micro level equations for dynamics of electron will not be valid here because you're talking about few number of electrons. Okay, so please get this fact into your uh, mind and brain that in the future, I'm going to have a device in my lab, uh, in my phone or in my electronic gadgetry, whatever gadgetry it is, where you are actually manipulating singular electrons. That means the electrons in terms of five electrons or 10 electrons or 15 electrons or 20 electrons. These are countable number of electrons or countable number of particles, okay? And these electrons are within a very, very small region of space in those devices, okay? It is like you have been constrained to a very, very small room. What will happen if you are constrained to a very small room? You get agitated, you know. This is our human nature that if I'm constrained or if I'm confined to a small room, for example, you know, when I say confinement, basically my picture goes to a jail, for example. The thieves are constrained and confined to a small cell. They are agitated or we also get agitated. That means my energy is not at all minimum. My energy is not at all zero in that sense. And the host of applications what we can think of from these devices with the limited number of electrons is basically because these particles are confined to small space. And as soon as you have confinement to small space, you get a minimum energy into the system. The Newtonian idea of uh, total energy zero, that means when you have kinetic energy zero and potential energy zero, will fail down, fail in this scenario, okay? And that is what we call it as a zero point energy. And uh, what Professor Keshav was talking about the other day was 
all because of this zero point energy okay so now since i'm i'm just talking about the solid state uh, low dimensional materials i'm just giving you some brief idea what is really happening and uh, what lies ahead for us okay this is the roadmap of uh, electronic industries uh, intel samsung tsmc and global foundry these are companies uh, who are actually manufacturing all those integrated circuits available in your laptop or in your computer or in your phone okay now 2015 they were about 28 nanometers okay also samsung tsmc global foundry was manufacturing them come 2020 we are in the regime of 10 and 5 6 12 for example okay and uh, come 21 the expectation is that you would be in the regime of seven four five nanometers okay the device is shrinking the device shrinking means you are confining these small fickle electrons into a smaller and smaller uh, place so what are the problems those are bigger problems actually to tackle okay okay now who are going to be the major players in this kind of uh, scenario okay most of the time what really happens is uh, when you want to go down from this uh, 7 nanometer uh, sized devices into 5 nanometer devices, okay, majority of the industry would not have a technical expertise. Okay? So this is the prediction, for example, when you go to 7, 5, 3 nanometer range of devices, only TSMC can manufacture or Samsung can manufacture or Intel can manufacture, while all these companies are not useful. Okay, they, they, they don't have expertise to manufacture these uh, devices uh, in that regime of uh, dimension. Okay, so these are low dimensions, you know. Now, when I say an electronic device, for example, a light emitting diode, for example, then you should think that what are the materials required in this scenario? Light emitting diode. So what I need is a PN junction. PN junction is basically a semiconductor junction which has n-type and p-type materials now you see the expertise you need to have you need to have a p-type material of that size n-type material of that size or you take a base material semi uh, silicon for example okay let's imagine are you able to see my video also yeah yeah okay my hands i'm just trying to uh, see the size actually so if, if this is my 5 nanometer, for example, that means I need to have uh, half of it as P-type and half of it as N-type. So just imagine the kind of expertise you need to have to make this uh, base silicon into a P-type silicon and N-type silicon, for example, in that hardly 3 nanometer range. That's not easy. That cannot be done in normal labs. Okay, please remember that. We still uh, are in the no normal laboratories. We are still in the regime of micron levels. Okay, they have uh, some special techniques uh, to go into smaller scale. Okay, and that is also another reason why they cannot change the technology as and when they want because the technology is well set, the process is well set, and they would not want to change it. Okay, now, all these technological development happen, and uh, the reasons reason for all the technological development and uh, more and more better understanding of nature and science is all because of this group of people you know now please uh, check who are these people albert einstein here uh, mary curie is here max planck is here deba is here iron fest here schrodinger is here paul is here de Broglie is here max born heisenberg niels bohr etc etc you know and i i see that this picture has about 26 people and out of that i think 19 people got the nobel prize this is to uh, this is a message to students just imagine you are going to a conference where such a gathering is available and you are speaking to them you know just imagine what would happen okay okay so as i said this uh, advancement of technology over the period of two three decades is all because of that scientific development happened over the three decades in the early last century okay it started from max planck it's it then went on with the 
uh, idea of photons with the idea of uh, uh, waves for electrons by de Broglie, for example, then uh, defining that uh, dynamical equation by Schrodinger and Heisenberg. And that is the basis for all these uh, technological developments. And people might wonder, or students might wonder, how is the Planck's idea are re uh, responsible for technological development, or how is the Schrodinger equation is responsible for all the technology what we have? You know, uh, that's a, a topic of discussion for another lecture sometime. Okay, so uh, just to give you a brief uh, this one. So 1905, it's a magic year. Ernest Miradlis, okay, where uh, Einstein uh, uh, published his famous papers, and 22, he got the Nobel Prize, 29, uh, De Broglie gets Nobel Prize, 35, Schrodinger gets Nobel Prize, Dirac, and um, Heisenberg, for example, Niels Bohr. So all these people are sort of fathers of uh, modern science and technology, okay? Now, the traditional way of uh, getting to a lower dimension is start with the bulk material and get into a small dimension, okay? That means you take a bulk material and uh, somehow evaporate, for example, technical term is evaporate this material onto a substrate. You get a film, you get a lower dimension of film. And that is not new for us, you know, we have seen in day-to-day -day experience that uh, the woodwork is done by people where they take a bulk uh, chunk of wood and they carve it and get a beautiful phase or a structure or so. This is exactly what we do in a miniaturizing process that we take a bulk material and we evaporate them in a certain process procedure, okay? And then we uh, design or uh, we fabricate devices in the scale of microns or micro technology, which was the uh, the technology of 1980s and 90s, for example. And then come uh, 2000 and uh, later on, we start to talk about nanotechnology where um, the, the number of atoms you are talking about is about 100 atoms, maximum 100 atoms. As I said, you, you have this uh, beautiful material called graphene. And if you want to design a material uh, or, a, or a fabricate a uh, device out of graphene, for example, what you need to do is you need to deposit some electrodes and you need to measure the conductivity and so on and so forth, okay? But our human body is so uh, extremely designed that we already have uh, uh, the devices of the scale, which we call it as proteins, for example, okay? So we can take some inspiration from nature, we can take some inspiration from our body structure itself, that means the entities which are building blocks of our human body, and then take a, or learn from them how do they work actually. Okay? And this topic of uh, modern science, which we call it as uh, single molecule science or single atomic level or atom technology. Okay, So uh, hopefully in, in a decade or so, uh, a undergraduate student in Mangalore University might be learning about little bit about atom technology or little bit about single molecular machines or single molecular logic devices. I am I'm hopeful, okay? Or even at least in the master scale, okay? Now, what is different in the lower dimension is, as I said, what you are actually doing is playing with those electrons in the material, okay? You don't have access to protons in the normal scenario. You don't have access to neutrons only access you have is electrons. So that means when you make these materials in the smaller scale, okay, that means you are confining these electrons available in the system to smaller and smaller space, okay? For example, if you make a film, that means as I said, you operate this material and make a film, for example, then what you do is you are allowing the electron to go in this direction, that's a free, Okay, free direction, that means electron can easily go in that direction, Kx, for example. Electron can go in this y direction also, because your film is such that you have a substrate and you deposited material here and uh, you had a film. So that means this electron can go in this direction, electron go in this direction. Okay, absolutely no problem. But there is a problem to go in this direction, in the vertical direction. 
okay and that is what i call it as a one dimensional confinement okay so when you lower the size of this material from three dimension okay three dimension to two dimension for example then that means you are confining this uh, electron in that two dimensional space or in general i can i can call it as one dimensional quantization that means the energy values in that particular direction will change where you have uh, restricted their motion but energy levels in this directions are like bulk because it is free okay so electrons can move in the uh, in this planar uh, region or planar direction if you make a wire for example nano wire so that means you reduce this dimension here into small uh, small dimension what you effectively are doing is you are confining this uh, electron motion in this direction you are confining their motion in this direction but you are allowing it to move in freely in this kx direction okay so that means this electron is over, able to move only in one direction in the case of carbon nanotube for example in the case of nano wires of various materials you are allowing the electron to move only in one direction you are confining them in perpendicular direction you are confining them in this particular direction so that they don't like you know they don't like they don't like this confinement also so their energies are different in that direction okay so then i call this as a two dimensional quantization okay this is a sort of a technical term so okay from bulk we came to two dimension we came to uh, one dimension for example then further you can reduce this size also here okay so then we end up getting a uh, uh, zero dimensional object and a zero dimensional object we call it as quantum dots or quantum uh, materials for example okay now as the picture says that uh, you are not allowing these electrons to go either in x direction or y direction or z direction you are not at all allowing them to go anywhere so the electrons are completely confined and they don't like that actually the electrons don't like it even just like humans i, I don't like to be confined in this uh, small space of my house for example this is what happened during the last 7 8 months for example we are all confined to our home homes and uh, we hear a lot of complaints now please start the university and so on and so forth you know nobody likes this confinement what happens is actually the energy decreases you know as in when you confine the material or confine the electrons in additional dimensions for example the energy increases okay and uh, that is the reason why you get an exotic properties of these materials for example gold you know uh, everybody knows gold and the uh, majority of them are even wearing gold it's fine fantastic material you know Uh, no, uh, it doesn't get affected by atmospheric uh, uh, entities like humidity and temperature at the normal scale. Now, the question you might ask is, what happens if you reduce the size you know, in terms of uh, nano wires and uh, nano dots, for example, or quantum dots? Please go back and check what is happening to uh, gold nano wire and gold nano dots or gold quantum dots. when when i say what is happening means are the properties of this gold quantum dots and gold nano wires same as the bulk what you are wearing for example or in the three dimension and you will end up seeing that they are not the melting point reduces okay the melting point reduces all the physical properties reduces conductivity changes and so on and so forth because you are confining that Uh, re, uh, the responsible entity you know electrons for example into a smaller and smaller space and which they don't like okay so uh, then so what really happens in low dimension you have zero dimensional uh, object means i call them as nano particles or quantum dots one dimensional object means you have nano wires and nano tubes and we have a thin films so now please remember that when i talk about these thin films these these are you know 200 nanometers and 1 micron thin film no please uh, don't be under the impression that uh, thin film means 1 uh, micron on a 200 200 nanometer film is not a film actually it is a three dimensional object when you when you talk about physical parameters okay 
200 nanometer film is already a bulk material, a three-dimensional material. Okay, but just that you would not be able to see that. That's why in uh, lay, uh, in the layman's language we called it as a film. Okay, so okay, so this is what happens. Okay, you reduce the size, you get various exotic properties, and so on and so forth. Now, there are two ways to produce these uh, low-dimensional materials. One, as I said, you start with the bulk material and reduce the size. And the process, we call it as top-down approach. That means it's just like a sculpture, making a sculpture. You take a wood, a log of wood and uh, carve it wherever you want and uh, make a beautiful structure. Similarly, you can take a bulk material and uh, use this... Uh, technique of evaporation, various methods of evaporations are there, and uh, you design this material in whatever size and shape you want in the small scale, okay? Another way is, uh, what you do is you take the raw material in nanoscale or atomic scale, for example, and build them, okay? For example, the supramolecular structure is basically what you do is you take the building blocks of these uh, structures, that is molecules, individual molecules, or in uh, language of chemistry, we call them as monomers, for example, and then build from that. So you have two methods. Either you can take it from top down and bottom up approach. Okay. So um, you are free to choose in terms of uh, you know, which method is easier for you. For example, top to bottom approach uh, needs a lot of investment, I would say. Like evaporation is not an easy task. You, can, you cannot evaporate a material on the tabletop, okay? You cannot do that. As if you remember, uh, two days back, uh, Professor Keshe was telling that you need to maintain a vacuum and so on and so forth. You have to do it here also. You have to maintain a vacuum and uh, then you heat this substance and evaporate. So that's a little bit expensive uh, affair. While the bottom-up approach is more uh, hands-on experience, hands-on work, you know, you use the raw materials, individual molecules, and uh, you can build the supramolecular structures or uh, organize the self-organized uh, structures, for example, because the energies involved is very, very small in that case, you know, molecule to molecule uh, junction happening, et cetera, et cetera. The energies are very, very small in terms of room temperature, for example. Okay? So that is why this process is mostly adopted in chemistry to design newer molecules and newer structures, for example, and uh, so on and so forth, okay? Okay, now, uh, what are the materials you will have to do in, if you really want to work on the future electronics, for example, okay? Resistor, of course, we all know traditionally, uh, we know what is meant by resistor. I hope we know. You know? <laughs> and uh, the next one is the capacitor course, uh, the, the device which has two plates and uh, insulator inside and so on and so forth, where you can store the charges. And then this is inductor. inductor. So basically you get R, C, L, uh, individual components. But now, please remember that there is another uh, fundamental block of electronics we need to add in the syllabus, okay, uh, which we call it as a memory stem, okay. So this is basically an oxide material, okay, like like uh, whatever is inside here, for example, and then it has a memory, basically. Okay? So that means uh, if you apply a voltage to a resistor, everyone has memory. Hello. Can you hear me or not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So if you if you apply a voltage to a resistor, for example, the curve you will get is a straight line. With certain slope that gives you a resistance. But if you do the same thing for a membristor, for example, it is no longer a straight line, but it has a history. Okay, it has a memory for that. Okay, and people say that this has to be a building block of electronics, not only R and C, but it also should be a membristor. So you have to design the newer materials in the small scale to make a, a, a resistor. You make a capacitor and you make an inductor, you also make a membrane. Okay, please remember that. Uh, okay, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> so, <coughs> some of the relevant uh, materials for <coughs> industry are, of course, semiconductors. I mean, we all have used them. 
uh, if you if you open your uh, phone for example there is a silicon wafer okay and uh, so all the electronics are defined in on this silicon wafer so then you have a gallium arsenide for example and uh, germanium for example and uh, so on and so forth alloys of all these things and so on. so these are semiconductors again <clears throat> please remember the the properties of these semiconducting materials will change as you reduce them to a smaller and smaller scales no matter what material you consider whether it's a metallic material whether it's a semiconducting material or an insulating material the properties will change as you reduce the size because after all what you are doing is you are playing with the electron whether the electron is in the semiconductor whether it's electron in the insulator or electron in the metal it is electron you know the confinement is basically confinement for electron it doesn't like it so obviously the properties will change okay so then we have a uh, the derivative of silicon for example silicon dioxide oxynitride for example silicon nitride so on and so forth most of the uh, integrated circuit that means most of the transistor fabrication involves these materials then of course metals you need you need uh, wires to connect them so gold for example aluminum copper tungsten etc etc you want to use it okay and uh, oxides for example aluminum oxide hafnium oxide cerium oxide okay and uh, then you have these beautiful materials you know silicon carbide gallium nitride and diamond for example you know i'm sure uh, some part, one section of audience will be excited to see wh why do you need to use uh, diamond here in the electronic industry okay but uh, uh, if time permits i will let you know why diamond is required Future uh, technology, okay, and then the low-dimensional materials. As I said, graphene is one of the classic example where you have carbon atoms arranged in hexagonal uh, hexagonal way, extended in two dimension. So there is no chance for electron to go in vertical direction. Please remember, and that's why all those exotic properties of graphene coming into picture. Okay, the disadvantage of graphene is that it doesn't have an energy gap. it's a zero energy gap material for all the electronics what you want to use the low dimensional material you need to have an intrinsic electronic gap that means for example silicon silicon has an energy gap of 1.1 electron volts okay germanium has 0.7 electron volts so and so forth so then only you can use them in electronics while graphene does not have so there lies the trouble of graph using graphene in all these electronics uh, or electronic circuit okay but there are ways to uh, create the energy gap in graphene and then the latest material which uh, have been studied uh, by many many people is hexagonal boron nitride so again this is a hexagonal lattice uh, while in the graphene all the six atoms are carbon while here in the hexagonal boron nitride it is boron nitrogen boron nitrogen boron nitrogen it is absolutely single sheet of material and uh, again it is a wide band gap material beautiful material and a uh, lot of exotic properties so there are two forms of this hexagonal material boron nitride i mean boron nitride one is hexagonal and one is cubic and uh, then you play with these materials like you put one on each other you know multi stack multi layer stacks for example and then they give you some other properties you know for example if you put graphene and mos2 together one is semiconductor one is a zero graphene material the effective property is not like graphene not like mos2 it is different mo3 for example molybdenum trioxide it's a it's a large band gap material and um, very nice you can uh, grow them in sheets i'll show you some pictures now in in couple of slides so these are sort of materials we require in uh, industry here is here is one uh, experiment i did Uh, these triangles are gold triangles okay gold triangles deposited mm -hmm. on mos2 again these are uh, sheets of material molybdenum disulfide mos2 sheet okay and then i deposited gold now look how beautiful these islands are now why do you want to grow gold on mos2 you know that's again a bigger question but uh, basically there was a plan of uh, using these gold islands to connect the 
you know, its molecule and uh, determine its uh, electronic structure. And all. Now, please remember, this is called scale bar here. <clears throat> okay, people who don't know the electron microscopy imaging, this is a scale bar. That means this length is 100 nanometers. Now, so then you can imagine what is the size of these small islands here. Okay. And uh, it, I found that these are single crystalline uh, gold islands. Okay. Uh, absolutely sitting on the MOS2. And uh, why single crystalline needed? Because the single crystals have uh, lesser and lesser defects. Okay. Less defects means better for electronic properties. Okay. And uh, here is one more material, as I said, this uh, molybdenum trioxide, for example. These uh, form uh, in terms of sheets, you know, transparent sheets, because its energy gap is very, very large. So obviously, uh, the material becomes transparent and uh, they have exotic properties, you know. Uh, I can use it in transistor, I can use it in uh, uh, multilayer structures and so on and so forth. And uh, another material, as I mentioned in silicon carbide, for example, again, a large band gap material, and you can grow them in low dimension. And uh, you can study them uh, uh, from the pure scientific or pure science point of view, you can study. And uh, you can also study from the point of view of uh, applications. Okay. And similarly, the, the hexagonal boron nitride, I have uh, told you. Uh, so you have uh, various methods of uh, preparing these materials in low dimensions. And uh, again, uh, if, if somebody is interested, please note down these numbers and uh, Google it and you will get this paper and images, you know. Uh, these are transmission electron microscopes, okay. So basically, uh, these images will tell you how the hexagonal, I mean, boron and nitrogen atoms are uh, situated in the lattice. Okay, now, <clears throat> bigger question is, can I do it in the table? You uh, do this, these things in, uh, in a small uh, tabletop because you please imagine that you have a single sheet of graphene. And if you keep it in the atmospheric pressure, that means open in ambient condition, what will happen is the moisture will come and sit on that. When I say moisture means water molecule. Water molecule is not a planar molecule. It has certain angle. This is H, this is H, and this is oxygen, H2O. So that means there is a charge distribution here. And obviously, when the water molecule is sitting on this graphene sheet, the charge is transferred to this graphene. So that means you are changing the property of this material. Just like all the adsorbent oxygen, for example, or a nitrogen molecule, or so on and so on. all the molecules you can think of, they come and sit on this material at nanoscale means they're actually transferring one charge to the material. Either they can transfer the charge or uh, transfer the uh, charge takes place from material to this molecule. So it is possible. So basically you are playing with these properties of this material. And that is why what we need is ultra high vacuum. Okay. So these are the sort of chambers for ultra vacuum systems. And uh, here are the pumps at the bottom and uh, there are a lot of uh, technical details involved. Uh, but yeah, so if you, if you really want to work on this nanoscale and atomic scale where you are playing with the few number of electrons, then obviously you need to have a better, uh, uh, better instruments, okay? So you can grow these uh, nanowires, for example, Okay, like beautiful gallium nitride nanowires. Okay, and again, whenever uh, you want to see them, please note down these numbers here. Okay, and uh, you can just search them. Now, why is these nanowires are interesting? Because the diameter here is 143, diameter here is 270. Now, these are uh, these are sort of direct band gap semiconductors, and the light emission properties uh, there. And you can see that the, di uh, the color emitted by these objects or these nanowires depends on what diameter it has. So that means you can have a uh, light color, that means wavelength emitted by this uh, material, depending on what is the uh, diameter of these, uh, uh, these nanowires. Good evening, sir. Need... Yes. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, continue. 
yes yes okay so uh, uh, that that's why the uh, the you know one dimensional wires are exciting you know so these are nano wires as i said the, the diameter is about 150 nanometers so that means the electrons are confined to, uh, or allowed to move only in one direction confined in this direction and this direction so please uh, go back to the same slide you know okay uh, then there are uh, some of the beautiful uh, quantum dots you can prepare and uh, these are uh, uh, colors emitted by uh, carbon quantum dots. Now how do they emit? Basically what you do is you prepare these quantum dots, carbon quantum dots and uh, expose them to UV light. Please remember UV light has a smaller wavelength compared to optical region. Smaller wavelength means larger energy. Okay, so you when you shine light on these carbon dots, what happens is you are pumping energy into the system. So that means the electrons within that quantum dot will get excited to higher energy level. And when they de-excite, they give out these optical light. Okay. So depending on the size of the quantum dots, for example, you have these various colors available for you. Again, it's not one day job. Please remember all the students, please remember this is not one day job. This is like a continuous process. You need to optimize uh, these uh, quantum dot size of the quantum dot and uh, clean in less of these uh, quantum dots. You know, it's not one day job. Please remember. Here I want to bring uh, my friend, good friend of mine, uh, uh, Professor, uh, he's in uh, Australia. Uh, we were colleagues and uh, he's one of uh, one of the fantastic guy who can do this wonderful work you know his name is prashant sonar and recently what they did was they he went to a barber shop and uh, you know he collected some hair hair human hair okay and he processed them you know processed them in in, in, in the sense they cleaned the hair and they heated them to various temperatures here in a, in a special atmosphere and they found that these different temperatures, when they heated, uh, this uh, human hair is heated, they actually give out a lot of light. I mean, uh, beautiful light of, uh, let's say, for example, here it is about 450 nanometers, x axis is 450 nanometers, you know. So, this is one of the beautiful uh, experiments, I would say, uh, one can do with the waste material, you know, human hair, you know, everywhere it is available. But uh, nobody till now, nobody thought about, okay, let me do this. It's, it's a source of carbon. You know, the human hair is a source of uh, uh, molecules. And these molecules are uh, carbon-based molecules. And, uh, with the optimized process, I can form a carbon dots. You know, you, for example, you can see the internal structure of these carbon dots. And uh, these uh, give out light uh, very nice. And recently in our group, we also have found a, a sort of similar uh, direction, waste to wealth, for example. And I took one uh, waste material available on the roadside. I would not uh, tell you now, so let it be secret. And uh, it does form the carbon dots, you know, it does give you a beautiful uh, colors of uh, uh, carbon dots. Okay, so, uh, as I said, you know, you don't need to think of, you know, doing science is all exotic and everything. You can start with the raw material, which is waste, for example, okay, available in nature, available in day-to-day -day life. And you can think of some good process to optimize the process and get these uh, quantum dots. Now, don't stop at uh, making these quantum dots. Now, you use these quantum dots and design some uh, devices. You know, for example, he... He's showing here a light emitting diode he prepared or fabricated, you know. So that's, that should be the goal, you know. You can prepare, you know, you can heat them, you can prepare these quantum dots. Yes, fine. But after that, what? You know, th that question we need to answer. Uh, how many minutes I have? Uh, five minutes? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'll take five minutes, okay. So uh, one of the recently, uh, uh, I, I was interested in uh, how do I relate or is there a correlation between uh, uh, biology and physics? You know, I, I work on these beautiful nanostructures, whether it is a top down approach or bottom up approach, I create these nanostructures and so on and so forth. I study their optics, I study their electronics and everything. Now my question was, is there any correlation between uh, the physics 
of these nanostructures and uh, is there a example in nature where I can actually take them? Okay. So one of the classic uh, example is these moti structure, you know, these are butterflies and uh, if you put them in the, under the microscope, you would see something like this. You know, this is the eye of a butterfly. And these are in the nanoscale. These are uh, sort of chitin. It's a, it's a chemical called chitin or it's a polymer called chitin. And these are in the, in the form of rods, okay? They sit on uh, these, uh, this curved surface and uh, these uh, uh, chitin rods are about a uh, few hundred nanometers and with the diameter of about uh, maybe 50 to 100 nanometers, okay? So I, what I did was I asked my good friend in Mangalore University, Dr. Champrasad, and um, he said, uh, okay, I have a butterfly, I have a moth and I have a butterfly also. Then I'll give you the IESCM uh, electron microscopy image of uh, the, these butterflies. You know what you see these eyes is this hexagonal lattice. You know, this is a large scale image. You see this uh, scale bar is 25 micrometer. And you can imagine this is about, um, let's say 100 microns, that is 0.1 millimeter. And in this eye of a butterfly or moth, for example, you have this hexagonal structure. And if you zoom in, what you see is these beautiful nanostructures here. Okay, the material is called chitin. Okay, and uh, they have this hexagonally oriented uh, arrangement. And uh, each of them has certain dimension. It's about, uh, uh, let's say, 100 nanometers. Okay, and the distance between them is also about 100 nanometers. And I was really surprised, you know, after all these uh, uh, work of uh, top to down approach and uh, lower bottom to top approach, the nature has already optimized this process of uh, having these beautiful nanostructures. Okay, and then we we uh, studied them in detail, and we found there are beautiful um, regions of space where there are regular arrangement like this, for example. There are regions of uh, eye where there are defects, and uh, it's, it's beautiful, you know, the, the topic is really beautiful. For example, if you consider this one, the nearest neighbors are only five here. This is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five, okay? Now, if you consider this one here, okay, these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. But if you consider this one here, it is seven, you see? So if you really uh, go deep into these images, you would actually see some beautiful defect structures. So why these defects are there, we don't know, okay? But they are there. And what I did was, okay, fine, these are hexagonal arrangements, okay? And then we, we really studied them in detail and all these uh, uh, seven, uh, you know, uh, nearest neighbor arrangement and five nearest neighbor arrangement. And it looks like they are randomly oriented, I mean, land, randomly scattered. But we don't know why these uh, defects are coming into picture, whether it is a structural issue because these are sort of curved surfaces, you know, the eye is curved surface. And maybe because of to minimize the energy, uh, it might actually create uh, these defects. Okay, the growth of these uh, chiral structures might create the defects, you know, to minimize the energy. I went back to the hexagonally available lattice, which is graphene or which is a hexagonal boron nitride. You know, these are hexagonal boron nitride, hexagonal uh, structures, okay? To my surprise, you know, th these uh, dimensions are about a few hundred nanometers. The 7.5 defect is about 100 nanometers or 200 nanometers. And then I went to this graphene and hexagonal boron nitride. Now, please remember, the hexagonal arrangement is in atomic dimension here. And to my surprise, the 7 phi defect is also there in graphene. You know, for example, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon atoms. And then this is one, two, three, four, five carbon atoms. So that same 7 and 5 arrangement is also there in macroscopically. And I say macroscopic means in terms of hundreds of nanometer. But the same kind of uh, organization. Okay, even though it is a defect, I say it is an organization available in atomic scale also, you know. So, so there has to be some very, very nice and very good uh, reason for 
uh, uh, nature to exist in this particular way. Okay, we are continuing this uh, research on this direction, and uh, hopefully we will get some uh, nice results in future. So since my time is up, I will have to uh, stop. Uh, so ultimately, people want to go for the devices or lower dimensional uh, materials, lower dimensional uh, uh, devices, for example, in such a way that they can uh, they can get benefit out of it. And so uh, I will uh, uh, conclude here. And uh, there are beautiful uh, 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 topics to discuss in discuss in biology, which are properly physics based, you know, purely physics based. And I will stop here and uh, just one message and there is plenty of room at the bottom. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ramesh. Uh, it is extremely difficult to complete all the uh, details of the uh, nanomaterial yes. in a given uh, short span of one hour. Uh, thank you for the fine presentation. If now it is a time for the discussion. If you uh, host me for one week, I will come and uh, I will discuss Certainly, this. certainly. <laughs> uh, now it is a time for the discussion. Uh, the participants can ask their question in the chat box. And also uh, they can unmute and they can make the direct discussion with the, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh, there is a question by Anaga Radhakrishnan. Good. Uh, there are luminous materials in some plants and creatures like jellyfishes. Can we use it in the nanomaterials? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. You know, we we have uh, uh, we have been seeing these uh, luminous material in uh, biology, plant material, and even the creatures. For example, I think in uh, uh, in our area, like uh, Puthur and uh, the, uh, South Kendra, we had these bees which would give out light, you know. So all these materials are actually solid state materials. And uh, the important part is uh, how do they get light out, you know. And it's, it seems that if you, these are quite, uh, kind of materials where if you um, put a strain on that, you know, if you stress these materials and they give out light. You know, you can create these or you can synthesize these materials also in the lab as nanomaterials. Okay. So again, inspiration from uh, uh, nature. You stress these materials and it is possible. Yes. Ramesh, uh, this uh, uh, spider, spider web, I think it is extremely strong. Uh, any uh, studies has been done regarding the strength of the spider web uh, yes, in yes. nanoscale, nanoscale? Yes, uh, recently I uh, was listening to one faculty from IIT. Hello. Uh, I forget ah, the yeah. name. And he has been uh, working on this uh, since a couple of years now. So, uh, yes, it is there. I mean, uh, uh, you can design the newer materials in terms of, uh, let's say, polymers and uh, in terms of newer materials to get the similar strength, you know. For example, uh, the carbon nanotubes are one of the kind of material where the atom to atom bonding is very, very strong. It's a covalent bond, you know. But if you come to a graphene sheets, the intergraphene uh, the interaction is more of van der Waal forces, which are very, very big. But the bonding between the atoms within the uh, sheet is extremely, extremely strong. And that is why people say that this is the hardest material or strongest material uh, uh, ever yeah, produced. Yeah. You know? Yes, yes. Of course, people are uh, studying them. Yes, definitely. Yeah, uh, participants. Uh... You can certainly have, can have the good interaction with uh, Dr. Ramesh. He's well versed in the uh, nano science. Uh, has done <laughs> lot of work, a lot of lot of lot of work in the, uh, the realm of uh, nano materials. 
Now the lab you have shown, one lab which you have shown, I think you are also there. Uh, is it in the Vellur uh, 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 Institute uh, or somewhere? Unfo uh, unfortunately uh, not. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because, ah, okay, uh, there is another question. Which material is the strongest material uh, which also oh, gives yeah. the luminescence? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, strongest material and luminescence, right? See, the, the thing is, uh, let's say you want to have a material which gives out light and it should be in the nanoscale. So either you can uh, tune the energy levels of this material, okay? Or uh, you can uh, design a piezo, so these materials which give out light due because of the straining or stressing are called piezoelectric material, okay? So obviously when you say the strongest material means that uh, I would imagine that it should not respond to your straining and uh, stresses. So the fact that they should give out light means that there has to be some changes in their uh, shape and size one okay and uh, of course if you go to a nano nano scale for example then the whole uh, discussion of uh, strength is completely different for example graphene you would say so why graphene has to be the strongest material you know uh, that's a completely different uh, uh, aspect but yes uh, strongest material and light emission might be a good topic for uh, miss anaga to study you know for your research. Ramesh, you uh, one slide which is regarding the colorful carbon dots you have shown. Yes. Uh, what is the difference between this carbon dot and the quantum dot? Is it a uh, difference? And also, uh, why it no sh uh, exhibit the different beautiful colors there? Okay. So, um, again, uh, this has to do with the confinement of the electrons. And uh, there are, you know, for example, if you go to uh, a subject of uh, finding out energy levels of uh, electron inside a small space, for example, confined space, okay, the difference in the energy levels depends on what is the size of the particle you have. So when I say difference in the two energy level means that you say, uh, the electron de excites from top energy level to bottom energy level. So that energy level or energy difference is given out as Hc by lambda. Delta E equal to Hc by lambda. So that means I can tune now this uh, delta E that is E2 minus E1 and I can have well-defined color given out by this material or this quantum dot. Now how do you tune this uh, E2 minus E1 is by changing the size of the color, uh, dots. Or size of this material. So there is a direct relation between the ease, that is energy levels, and the size of the particle you have, or size of the confinement. This is the first uh, lecture of quantum mechanics, quantum confinement. So the different color basically comes due to the fact that they are of different size. Okay? And uh, you can directly relate. There are the two. Uh... Yes, please. Okay, yes, yes. So, so uh, uh, what you do basically good. is uh, tune the size of the uh, uh, carbon dots, okay, and then excite them using a UV light and find out what is this E2 minus E1 giving you. Once E2 minus E1 is such that that Hc by lambda corresponds to blue light, for example, okay, another time the Hc by lambda was corresponding to yellow light the photon of that particular wavelength and so on and so forth. So basically it is it is the controlled mechanism of creating these dots of various size, sizes, even though they are carbon dots, okay? So basically carbon dots corresponds to the dots uh, by carbon, uh, from the carbon itself. The quantum dot is basically general terminology for these so it can be a, a carbon dot, it can be uh, the germanium dot, it can be some other dots, you know. So it's a general term, quantum dot. And it already tells you that the properties are quantum properties. Okay. I hope I explained you. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
No, Ramesh, uh, Ashit Tavike, yes. uh, associate professor in our PG department, uh, he has one question. Is it possible to fabricate heterojunctions using chemical thin film deposition techniques? Uh, heterojunctions. Uh, if he's, uh, so let me, let me make myself clear, whether it's a lateral junction or uh, vertical junctions. Please, sir, uh, type it in or unmute yourself. Ah, yeah, probably. I should, if you are there, you can unmute yourself and you can make a discussion. Okay, in the. Uh, okay, okay I, will, I will answer that. It's fine. Yeah. So I'll answer both. Okay, lateral heterojunction, lateral junction, and uh, the vertical junctions. So the lateral junction itself is a process of uh, manipulating the um, doping profile. For example, as I said in, during the lecture that if you have a silicon, for example, and if you want to make this as P-type and N-type, what you do is preferentially dope it at various places. Like you can have a, uh, a doping element which can make it as a N-type and which can make it as a P-type. Now, please, when you discuss this P-N junction, please don't be under the impression that you take a P silicon and a N silicon and then join them together. No, that's not how experiments work or uh, the manufacturing works. You preferentially dope them with the P type and make it as a P type and make it as an N type. And ultimately you will get a junction where you have a P N junction. So this is the case of lateral one. Okay? Now, in the case of vertical one, obviously you have a control of what sort of uh, uh, doping you can make for this particular material. Again, chemical thin film deposition is basically you evaporate these materials and uh, have a controllable or controllable uh, doping profile. You can do that, yes. Vertical junctions can also be made and lateral junctions can also be made, yes. Ramesh, there is a query by uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Shetty. Uh, at other department of uh, PG Center, St. Aloysius College. And it yes, is also yes. useful, we also. Uh, he asked, <laughs> do, you, the uh, there is a, do you have student collaboration projects for MSc students on nanomaterials? Uh, certainly, our PG students have the project work in the, their final semester. And yes. suppose in any case, if, if there is a collaboration, it will be very useful. OK. Uh... <laughs> I am new to this system, so if I'm completely free, then I am I'm most welcome to take your students. I mean, absolutely no problem at all. But I have to discuss this with the department. I will come back to you. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. Even this is the answer to Dr. Chandrasekhar Shetty. <laughs> Okay, if there are the, uh, no questions or the discussion, uh, probably uh, we can wind up, you know. Oh. Uh, if anybody has a question, for example, mm -hmm. and they are hesitant to ask in this, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, discussion, you can write to me too. I'll write my uh, email address. Yeah, it is better. Normally students are a bit reluctant to ask questions. The most difficult question I can imagine is why are you doing this? You know, <laughs> this <is a> bigger, <laughs> most uh, difficult question to answer. Why do you do this? You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so yeah. I I typed in my email. Yeah, address. yeah. Your email is uh, in the chat box, and uh, uh, we can note down. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, thank you, Doctor Ramesh. Uh, you see, the future is. Uh, always exciting is it not we are moving yes. from unknown to unknown just a decade ago who have imagined smartphones of a small size and there's a palm size by which one can be able to connect the whole world uh, Ramesh you have given the glimpses of the exciting future uh, when the uh, from the bulky material which can be vaporized and then uh, different techniques so that we can fabricated a, a material of a, a very small in size and the technology behind, the physics behind and so on. Uh, it's extremely interesting topic, but uh, too difficult to 
squeeze it in a uh, in one hour and uh, your uh, the, uh, the effort which is uh, uh, very worthwhile and on behalf of the uh, the college and the department and the students and the, the whole participants thank you ramesh for spending so yes. much time with us uh, and, and it's a pleasure for us before ending i just want to say one few couple of sentences uh, i hope you all are doing safe now you know uh, that's most important yeah. for us science can be done tomorrow but for us Correct. right now in this pandemic situation being healthy and being safe is most important thing so you all keep safe and uh, safe your i mean keep safe your family also back at home and uh, good luck to everybody friends uh, uh, now i uh, it is a time to say the goodbye and also thanking the people who who have made this particular webinar series a successful one i thank uh, uh, regional science center pilikula and its director dr k v rao and also the curator jagannath uh, and then i thank faculty members of the physics department dr deepak de silva who uh, coordinated this uh, whole webinar series and then uh, technical expertise as given by mr uh, mr vipin nayak associate professor in the pg department and dr pravin prakash disosa uh, and also dr asit uh, and all the students who have given the support and the large number of the participants uh, uh, almost for the uh, five days it is a, uh, it is, it is a, as say some sort of a regular feature and it is around 70 75 participants and very with the interest they have participated uh, and the thanks for all the participants and also uh, i would like to thank professor leo noron a principal of the college reverend dr anthony prakash mantero chairman of the pg studies and all those who helped in uh, arranging this uh, particular uh, webinar series Uh, which is a new experience uh, which is a new experience for uh, we the faculty members uh, finally i thank the each and every one for the part uh, who uh, participated in the webinar series and all the resource persons uh, and uh, uh, today's resource person dr ramesh uh, tamankar uh, and in future uh, we see physically uh, not virtually like this uh in the uh, college itself yes, okay thank you yeah. uh, thank goodbye you.